In this research methods and psychology video, it's content analysis. Quantitative data is great. We can make tables, charts, work out averages, and do statistics on it. But what about when the data has been collected and it's in the form of words? Well, there is a way to turn this into this. So let's look at content analysis, its strengths and weaknesses, and a classic study that looked at the different sexual choices of males and females. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. Let's start with a definition of content analysis. It's an indirect observational method. So we can observe human behavior through the things that humans make. A word we can use for things that humans make is an artifact. So I could perform a content analysis on 1950s advertisements, the art of the Middle Ages, films from the late Victorian age, or Greek parts. But generally when we conduct content analysis, it's on the written word and the process allows us to give a quantitative description of qualitative human communication. To start a content analysis, you begin by deciding the research question and then selecting an appropriate sample. So your sample could be a selection of diary entries, tweets, or children's books. You usually won't be able to analyze every possible example, so you'll have to decide how you select your sample. Examples of behavior you're recording are called coding units or behavioral categories, and these are linked to your research question. And in the same way we discussed in the observation video, they need to be operationalized. And that means defined so that it can be as precisely measured as possible and then recorded in a frequency table. Lonely hearts. Let's discuss a particularly interesting content analysis by Wainforth and Dunbar. This should help us understand the process of content analysis a little better. The researchers were interested in the theories of mate choice in sexual relationships and how these match ideas from evolutionary psychology. In short, the evolutionary theory is this. Both men and women want to have children to pass on their genes. However, because of their biology, they should have different reproductive strategies. Men will look out for younger and attractive mates as indications of fertility. Whereas women, on the other hand, will look for older mates because men are fertile for longer than women, but also look for males with resources, like a house, a good job, and money to provide for a potential family. And males tend to get more resources as they age. Yeah, this theory is pretty problematic. Um, so, that's the evolutionary theory. To test these ideas, 881 Lonely Heart adverts were taken from four newspapers in America. Now, the ages were recorded, and coding frames for physical attractiveness included terms like athletic, attractive, cute, fit, good-looking, healthy, nice body for both sexes, handsome, hunk, muscular, rugged, tall, well-built for males, uh, buxton, petite, pretty, shapely, slender, slim for females. Coding frames for wealth included terms referring to home ownership, professional status, being well-off, a business owner, or university educated, or suggesting an above-average lifestyle. When this qualitative data was turned into quantitative data, it backed up the evolutionary theory. Men looked for significantly younger mates and females significantly older mates. Men showed off their resources more than women, women asked for resources more than men, women mentioned their own attractiveness more than men, and men asked for attractive partners more than women. So you can see from this example of content analysis how a large set of qualitative data that wasn't created for the researchers can be used by psychologists turned into quantitative data and provide evidence to a research question. Conducting a content analysis and testing for reliability. So if you were asked to complete a content analysis, this is what you'd do. Firstly, you need to decide measurable categories to record. And this would be linked to the content you've collected. So for example, looking for sexist references in a set of interviews or advertisements. Then you would need to carefully work through the recordings or pages and tally each time one of the categories appears. And you may, in the same way as an observation, want to check the reliability of content analysis. That is, is it repeatable? Do you get the same data doing it again? Is it consistent? And the same options that you had for an observation are possible. Test, retest, and interrate reliability. Test, retest would simply involve running content analysis again on another occasion with the same set of data and comparing the results of the two sets of data. Interrater reliability would mean that you'd have to get a second rater so two researchers complete the same content analysis separately, tallying using the same set of agreed operational categories, of course. And then they can compare the two sets of data. Now for both test retest and interrater reliability, we're looking at how much correlation we have between the two sets of data. Researchers when conducting a test of correlation will generally accept a correlation coefficient of 0.8, as shown the data is reliable. Evaluations. 
So evaluations, what's good and what's bad about the use of content analysis in psychological research? Well, let's do the positives first. As the material was not created for research, but are real artifacts created by people, they have high external validity. This should be a true reflection of how people behave, and as long as we've carefully selected our sample, we should be able to apply these findings to other groups and situations. It's also generally kind of easy to get a sample. This data already exists in the real world and is often freely accessible. Replication is also possible by other researchers who can analyze the data with the same behavioral categories. However, as with any type of research that requires interpretation of meanings, there's a possibility of observer bias, with the researcher applying behavioural categories in a way that matches their research question. We can also suggest content analysis lacks validity. The data is created for other purposes other than the research, and is a record of opinions, not behaviour. Diaries and letters and tweets might not be truthful records. Thematic analysis before I finish, I want to quickly discuss a variation on content analysis called thematic analysis. Rather than starting using predetermined categories and then counting the frequency of these categories, like in content analysis, in thematic analysis, the researcher starts by attempting to discover the deeper meanings of the text or interviews by carefully reading the first, spotting patterns that can be coded, and then identifying themes from that process. We will call those themes emergent. Now, this is a more flexible way of analysing qualitative data with theories coming after the discovery of themes, and this is intended to stop the researcher imposing their own ideas onto the text. But, of course, thematic analysis as a form of content analysis shares many of the strengths and negatives of content analysis. And so that was content analysis. I have six tutorial videos covering 2017, 18 and 19 AS and A-level research method sections. These videos have worked examples of every question and are full of exam tips. Patrons at the neural level and above can access these, as well as many, many more hours of exam tutorial videos, as well as over 100 printable resources from across the A-level over on psychboost.com. And I do want to thank all the students and teachers who have supported Psychboost over on Patreon during the development of the Research Methods Unit. It's their support that allows me to teach part-time so I can make Psychboost on YouTube for everyone. So thanks to them, and I'll see you in the next Research Methods video, Case Studies.